I'm going to introduce our keynote now, who is Laya Bikaris. Do you want to come up, Laya? Okay, I'm just going to read out your biog then. So, Laya Bikaris is Professor of Social Science and Health in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London. She's a social epidemiologist by training, and her research focuses on understanding the pathways by which the discrimination and marginalization of people and places lead to social and health inequalities. This work is mostly focused on using social and health survey data to examine the association between othering, oppression, and health in order to understand how experiences of discrimination pattern people's health and social outcomes, as well as that of their children, and how the accumulation of experience discrimination across people's lives determines their health as they age. So really pleased to have Laya here. Laya's an ex-colleague of mine as well, which is lovely. And you studied here at UCL as well. You did your PhD here? Yeah. So good alumni, and uh, over to you. Thanks, Vanessa. And thank you for inviting me to present. And congratulations on the grant. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah. yeah, so it's so nice to be here, because I, I've built my career to date mostly on data that I've used and analyzed them and downloaded from UK Data Service, many of which has been collected by Natsen. And as Vanessa said, I did my PhD here in this building using some of the, the data that I will present today. And we were talking with Nicola that right after my PhD, uh, the first job was a maternity cover analyzing the 2008 Health Survey for England, working with Natsen and UCL. And then I moved to Manchester where Vanessa and I were corridor neighbors and where I continue to analyze health survey data to really understand and document, or try to understand and document, the fundamental role of racism in leading to ethnic inequities in health, which is what I want to talk about today. And I will present four pieces of work where I can, I, I hope to show how we can use health survey data to really understand the role of racism in leading to poor health of minoritized ethnic groups to understand the cumulative exposure to racial discrimination over the lives of minoritized ethnic people, and then understand the association between this accumulated exposure to racial discrimination and how there's an incremental association with worsening health, and then maximize health survey data by linking it to administrative data to really differentiate structural processes, structural forces driven by racism that are hardly detrimental to health versus community mechanisms, community forces that offer protective benefits on health. So really disentangling these two competing mechanisms. And so I want to start by reminding us of the stark ethnic inequities in health that have been documented in the UK. And I will present data from six different, five different surveys that you can find in the UK data service uh, showing over time the relative probabilities of reporting fair and poor surveyed health for the main minoritized ethnic groups captured in the surveys compared to white British people aged 40 and older. So there's a lot of info coming up, but I'll walk you through it. So top to your top left is data from the fourth national survey of ethnic minorities, which was collected in 1993, 1994. Next to it, data from the 1999 Health Survey for England, which had a boosted sample of ethnic minority participants. Then next to it, data from the 2004 Health Survey for England, which again had a boosted sample of ethnic minority participants. And the last time that the Health Survey for England had a, a boosted sample of ethnic minority participants, and 2007 is the citizenship survey. And in 2007, it included for the first time two measures of health. So before it had only recorded limiting long-standing illness, but in 2007, it also captured the rated health. And then next to it, the first wave of understanding society. So this is data from the five-minute sample. And next to it, wave seven of understanding society, which included um, sort of a refresher sample with migrants and new ethnic minority people. And so we have over 20 years of data here and three different models. So the model in blue shows the relative probabilities, predicted probabilities of reporting poor surveyed health for minoritized ethnic groups compared to the white British group, which you can see in the dashed line over zero, just adjusted for age and age square. 
and you can see across most minoritized ethnic groups that they have higher predicted probabilities of reporting poor celebrated health. And this is particularly stark for Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Black Caribbean, and Indian people. Then the model in red adjusts for harmonized measures of socioeconomic position. And so we include harmonized measures of equivalent uh, household income, educational qualifications, and NSEC, so a measure of socioeconomic position. And you can see that when we adjust for socioeconomic inequities, ethnic inequities in health reduce, attenuate, but still remain, particularly for Pakistani, Bangladeshi, and Black Caribbean people over time. And then in green, you can see for the surveys where it's available, we further adjust for experiences of racial discrimination. And you can see that adjusting for experiences of racial discrimination further attenuates ethnic inequities in health, but it doesn't really make a, a substantial contribution, at least in these models. But overall, what we can see is that ethnic inequalities are stark for most minoritized ethnic groups and that they have persisted over time. So for example, for Bangladeshi people, you can see in, in the blue model, they have at least twice the likelihood of reporting poor celebrated health compared to white British people. Pakistani and black Caribbean people have at least 1.5 times the probability of reporting poor celebrated health compared to white British people. And over time, there have been many explanations behind these ethnic inequities in health, many of which by now have been shown to not contribute or contribute very minimally to ethnic inequities in health, including genetic differences or differences in culture and behavior. So these, we now know, are not key reasons behind ethnic inequities in health, but we know that underlying socioeconomic inequities are a key cause of ethnic inequities in health but racism is the fundamental cause of ethnic inequities in health that we see here. And racism leads to poor health of minoritized ethnic groups both directly, but also indirectly by leading to socioeconomic inequities. And so given the centrality of racism in this presentation and in my work, I want to start by providing the definition that I use to conceptualize ethnic inequities in health and the role of racism. And there are many definitions out there, but I use this one by Charles Mills, who defines racism, or as he argues, global white supremacy as a political system, a power structure of formal or informal rule, socioeconomic privilege, and norms for the differential distribution of material wealth and opportunities, benefits and burdens, rights and duties. And I like this definition because Mills makes explicit that racism is, is a global system. It's not particular to one individual country. And also that racism is a system, a system that structures advantage for white populations and disadvantage for minoritized ethnic populations. And it's not only about interpersonal interactions so individual interactions between people, what we know as racial discrimination, but rather a system that structures advantage and disadvantage and that, as I will show, leads to stark socioeconomic inequities that then lead to poor health. And there are many mechanisms by which racism leads to poor health. These are not mutually exclusive, uh, and I will not go into detail uh, for any of them because each one of them is a presentation on their own. But just briefly, racism leads to poor health of minoritized ethnic groups by leading to unequal exposure to toxins in the environment, like pollution or noise, so environmental racism, by leading to interpersonal violence, including from the police, by leading to psychosocial trauma, via interpersonal racial discrimination, and this includes microaggressions, by leading to targeted marketing of detrimental substances like uh, fast food or tobacco, and it also includes via social media, by leading to socio sociopolitical exclusion, and this includes from data, so who we capture in the data with sufficiently large samples that we, we can conduct meaningful analysis, but also what we ask of participants, so if we don't ask about experiences of racial discrimination, it's, it's impossible to capture it. Uh, but also what we ask of the data. So all of these things really produce and reproduce ethnic inequities in health. Then by discrimination in healthcare, which leads to unequal treatment and then leads to differential outcomes. And then finally, I've put it at the bottom by leading to socioeconomic disadvantage. Uh, it's, 
and as, as I will talk in the, in the presentation, it's very important to remember that racism leads to socioeconomic disadvantage of minoritized ethnic groups and socioeconomic advantage of white people, which then leads to poor health. And there are many pathways by which this happens, for example, racism in education, via in classroom interactions or societal expectations that then lead to stereotype threats uh, or are in, under investment in schools with greater proportions of minoritized ethnic pupils, racism in employment, which we have documented with lower rates of recruitment, um, lower salary for the same job, lower rates of promotion, unequal exposure to environmental hazards experienced by minoritized ethnic workers, and then also via area level mechanisms, so neighborhood mechanisms, so through historical discrimination in housing markets and their investment in areas with greater proportion of minoritized ethnic residents, poorer transport, transport connections in these areas, but also increased access to violence in these areas, lower access to green spaces, lower access to uh, healthy and affor affordable food, and so on. Via these area level mechanisms, racism also leads to poor health of minoritized ethnic groups. And the, we have, in the UK, we have stark evidence of ethnic inequities in socioeconomic position. And given the, the, this evidence, but also the literature around the social determinants of health, often when we think about ethnic inequities in health, we think, when, on, a, on a good day, when we're not thinking about genetic differences or, or cultural differences, we think, okay, Ethnic, these underlying ethnic inequities in socioeconomic position are the key driver of ethnic inequities in health. And some, oftentimes, academic discourses, but also policy discourses, focus on co conceptualizing and empirically examining and addressing socioeconomic disadvantage as the key cause, the fundamental cause of ethnic inequities in health. And of course, addressing disadvantage is crucial to improve population health. But if we think about ethnic inequities in health, starting with socioeconomic disadvantages is not enough because we are ignoring racism, which is really the fundamental cause of socioeconomic disadvantage and then of poor health. And there, I mentioned we have plenty of evidence. I have provided here only three examples around unemployment, housing, and pension income just to quantify how stark these inequities are. So for example, around unemployment, people from Pakistani, Bangladeshi, and Black Caribbean groups have much higher rates of unemployment. This is almost three times as high for Black Caribbean men compared to white men, and more than three times as high for Pakistani women compared to white women. In terms of housing, most minoritized ethnic groups have much higher rates of overcrowding compared to white British households. So for example, 22.5% of Bangladeshi household uh, experience overcrowding, 17% of Arab households experience overcrowding, and 1.7% of white British households uh, experience overcrowding. So really stark differences. And if we think about how these inequities accumulate over the life course and think about pension income, the percentage difference in pension income for pensioners from a minoritized ethnic group compared to pensioners from white background is 24%. But if we think about the intersection between racism and sexism, the pension difference, pension income difference for women from minoritized ethnic groups compared to white men is 51%. So really stark differences in later life. And again, because we know how strongly associated socioeconomic disadvantage is to poor health, we really think about if we address socioeconomic disadvantage, then we will address ethnic inequities in health. But this, again, disregards the fundamental cause of racism in leading to poor health of minoritized ethnic groups directly, but also importantly, indirectly, by leading to increased socioeconomic disadvantage. So I want to show you some, a study we did using understanding society, where we took advantage of the longitudinal nature of understanding society, but also the fact that it collects measures of discrimination to look at the association between racism and mental health of minoritized ethnic groups. And so to look at this direct association, but also to look at how racism leads to increased socioeconomic disadvantage, which then leads to poor mental health. 
So we are looking at the direct and indirect effect of racism on poor mental health. And this is not a study of inequities. We're not comparing the mental health of minoritized ethnic groups to that of white British people, but really within minoritized ethnic groups, we are looking at how racism structures mental health directly, but also crucially by leading to reduced socioeconomic position. And so we, have, we analyze five waves from understanding society. So understanding society, every other wave asks some of their participants about experiences of discrimination that they have gone through. And then if they say yes to any of these experiences, then participants are asked, why do you think you experience this? Is it because of your gender, your sexual orientation? Is it because of your ethnicity, your nationality, or your religion? So we use these three attributions to develop a measure of racial discrimination. And the experiences that were asked were about whether people had been verbally insulted, physically abused, whether people avoided places, or whether people felt unsafe in public spaces because of their ethnicity, nationality, or religion. So this is our measure of racial discrimination. We measure mental health with the SF12 mental health component score, and we use equivalized household income as the measure of socioeconomic position. And so, this is complicated, but just to, to remind you that we're looking at the direct effect of racism on mental health, and we capture racism with a latent variable that captures these three observed variables. So whether people had been physically or verbally inserted, whether they avoided places, or whether they felt unsafe. So we look at the direct effect of racism on mental health cross-sectionally, but also longitudinally. So whether experiencing racism in wave one is associated with lower mental health in wave three, and so on. And so we also look at the association between racism and mental health indirectly by seeing how it is associated with socioeconomic position, which then may be associated with mental health. And again, we do this cross-sectionally at time of measuring racism. We measure socioeconomic position and mental health, but also longitudinally to examine whether experiencing racism in, in wave one is associated with lower socioeconomic position in wave three, and then lower mental health in wave three. <coughs> so the first thing I wanna show you is the unadjusted association between experiencing racial discrimination and levels of mental health. And so for each of these three domains of racial discrimination, so verbal or physical assault, feeling unsafe in places, and avoiding places, you can see these are unadjusted findings. But there's a clear association between experiencing racial discrimination and lower levels of mental health. So at the top, you can see the levels of mental health among minoritized ethnic groups who do not report experiencing racial discrimination. And at the bottom, is the, the, the line at the bottom is the levels of mental health among minoritized ethnic groups who have reported these three ex domains of racial discrimination. And so you can see that the levels of mental health among minoritized ethnic groups people who report racial discrimination is much lower than the levels of mental health of ethnic minority people who do not report racial discrimination, and this association seems to strengthen over time. So when we look at our model, we find evidence of direct effects of racism on poor mental health, but this only happened in cross-sectional models. So at time of experiencing racism, or racial discrimination rather, we see lower levels of mental health. And this happens across waves. But we do not see any evidence of direct effects of racial discrimination on mental health longitudinally. So experiencing racial discrimination in wave one is not associated directly with levels of mental health at wave three, for example. But when we look at longitudinal models, then we do see an association between experiencing racial discrimination in one wave a reduction in household income in a subsequent wave, which is then associated with lower levels of mental health. So for example, you can see experiencing racial discrimination in wave seven is associated with lower levels of mental health in wave nine, and this operates via increased socioeconomic disadvantage. So overall, we see longer term effects of racial discrimination that operate through lower income and poorer mental health over time. And this association is, has a direct effect at cross-sectional models. 
And so understanding society is very useful so because we can use longitudinal data and experiences of racial discrimination to document these associations, but these findings really underestimate the role of racism, both in leading to increased socioeconomic disadvantage of minoritized ethnic groups, but also in leading to poor mental health because understanding society asks about experiences that participants experience in the last 12 months, so in the last year, but also because it asks about relatively few domains where discrimination may have happened, right? So we have three different measures, so physical and, and verbal insults, feeling unsafe in public, and avoiding places. And I want to show you now data from the events study, which we collected during the pandemic. And the event study is a, a large survey of ethnic minority people collected during the, the pandemic, which really focuses on experiences of racism and inequality. And it includes a measure I developed with colleagues in Australia, in the US, and with James Nasser here in the UK. And this measure really captures a lot of domains where racial discrimination may have been experienced. For example, seeking housing, uh, seeking employment, seeking education, by the police, by neighbors, by family members, by friends. And, but also it asks about multiple time points where racism may have taken place. So in the past year, one to five years ago, five to 10 years ago, and more than 10 years ago. And I want to show you some of, of that data just to underscore first how prevalent experiences of racial discrimination are in the UK, but also we may extrapolate findings that I just showed from understanding society to how they are really underestimated if we think, or if we are able to capture a more comprehensive understanding of the prevalence of racial discrimination in the UK. And so this is data from the event study, and this presents the prevalence rate for all minoritized ethnic groups combined. But, uh, and I have only shown some of the domains we capture, so whether people are, have been insulted, physically attacked, they have experienced unfair treatment in education, unfair treatment, in employment, in public, by the police, or while seeking housing. So these are only some of the domains, but you can see if, if you look at the domains that racial discrimination is highly prevalent across all these domains, but also very prevalent in a persistent experience across people's lives. So across different time points, you see how, how, how prevalent racial discrimination is, and I have broken down the, the sample into three broad age groups. So in, in golden, you can see people aged 18 to 30. In the purple line, you can see people aged 31 to 50. And in this turquoise bar, you can see people aged 50 and older. And so experiences of racial discrimination are, are patterned by age, so that, as you can see, people who are aged 50 and older have higher rates of, or higher prevalence levels of racial discrimination more than 10 years ago. So you can see that more than 16% of people aged 50 and older experience unfair treatment in employment, for example. And more than 14% of people aged 50 and older were verbally insulted more than 10 years ago. But it's also a, more, a, a recent experience. So you can see over 80% of people aged 50 and older reported being verbally insulted in the past year, um, and so experiences in employment, in education, and so on. So it's not just an experience of the past, but it's a present experience as well. And you can also see that younger people report higher levels of experience racial discrimination <coughs> in the most recent times, but they also report experiences of racial discrimination more than 10 years ago in education. So, it's a, a, a constant experience over people's time, over people's lives, sorry. And if we just ask about experiences in the last 12 years, we really miss how prevalent racial discrimination is. And I want to show, I want to show you now experiences for the individual minoritized ethnic groups and uh, more domains that we capture. You can see that about 80% of black Caribbean people have reported experiencing verbal insults because of their ethnicity. Over 50% uh, of white gypsy or Irish traveler people 
have had their property de deliberately damaged because of their ethnicity. So really high levels uh, of experienced racial discrimination in the UK. And then here, uh, looking at different domains, whether people have been unfairly treated in education while seeking housing, while seeking employment and from the police. So I wanted to present this data just to, to show how prevalent and persistent experiences of racial discrimination is, but also to, to perhaps think if we really capture in a more comprehensive way experiences across domains and across time, we may have a better idea of the, the central role of racism in patterning people's lives, not only in terms of socioeconomic disadvantage, but also in terms of health. And so I wanted to, to conceptualize how these different experiences, the persistence of racial discrimination in people's lives really impacts on, on the health of minoritized ethnic groups, thinking about accumulation, accumulation of racial experience of experiences of racial discrimination across domains, so being uh, verbally insulted and experiencing unfair treatment in employment, for example, but also over time. So we have seen with data from events that these are, are persistent experiences across people's lives. And so I wanted to show you a study where we used data from understanding society again to really conceptualize not only experiencing this racial discrimination at, at one point in time or just in, in one event, but really thinking about how racial dis discrimination accumulates over people's lives, both cross-sectionally thinking about domains, so being verbally insulted, for example, avoiding places, um, so how this accumulation of experiences across domains, but also over time, so if this happens once or, or more than one time, how is this associated with mental health? And I want to show you here findings from the cross-sectional analysis. So what this graph shows are the levels of mental health for minoritized ethnic groups who report experiences of racial discrimination compared to the mental health of ethnic minority people who do not report any experiences of racial discrimination. And this is the reference group represented by the bold line over zero. And the first bar shows you what it has been documented in the literature, that people who experience racial discrimination have lower levels of mental health. But to the right, you can see a, a clear dose-response relationship, whereby the more racial discrimination ethnic minority people experience, the worse their mental health is. So people who just experience, well, not just, but people who experience one event, for example, being verbally insulted, have lower levels of mental health compared to people who don't experience any racial discrimination. But people who, who experience two items, for example, being verbally insulted and avoiding places, have lower levels of mental health compared to people who don't ex do not experience any racial discrimination or do not report any experiences, but also compared to ethnic minority people who report just one experience. And then the, in the last bar, you can see the, the worsening of mental health experienced by people who report three or more experiences. So clear evidence of an association between accumulation of racial discrimination and poor mental health. And so these are cross-sectional analyses. I want to show you now findings from the longitudinal analysis where we use two waves of understanding society to look at accumulation across domains, but also over time. And the first two bars show what was in the, in the previous slide. So at one point in time, people who experience discrimination have worse mental health, and, and people who experience discrimination in more than one domain have worse mental health compared to the baseline who are ethnic minority people who do not report any experiences of racial discrimination. But the last three bars show accumulation over time as well. And again, you can see a clear dose-response relationship whereby people who report experiencing discrimination across multiple <coughs> domains, but also across multiple time points, have worse levels of mental health compared to people who do not report any experiences of racial discrimination, but also to people who do report experiences of racial discrimination, but just in one point in time or just in, in, in two or more domains. And if, if we put together findings, these findings with the data that I just showed you from events, which clearly documented how prevalent and persistent experiences of racial discrimination 
are across the lives of minoritized ethnic groups, we can really extrapolate how, how much the harm of racial discrimination on mental health really is for minoritized ethnic groups. And so I have shown you uh, experiences of accumulate, how accumulation of racial discrimination operates across domains and over time. And I want to now show you an analysis we did using the Millennium Cohort Study to look at vicarious exposure to racial discrimination in the early life course. So the data from Understanding Society showed uh, own experiences of racial discrimination, but studies have shown that vicarious or anticipatory exposure to racial discrimination is also associated with poor mental health. And so in this study, we're asking whether growing up in, an, in a racist environment or an environment, a family, a household, a neighborhood where racial discrimination is common, is that associated with social emotional development of children? And we use data from the Millennium Cohort Study, which is still collecting data from children who were born at the turn of the millennium. And Understanding Society oversampled ethnically mixed and disadvantaged areas. And here I use data from the third wave of the MCS, which asked the respondents, which are often the mother, about experiences of, of racial discrimination and fair treatment that they had experienced, that their family members had experienced, but also how common are racist attacks in, in the area where you live in this area. And I measure social emotional development with the SDQ, which is a, a well used measure of difficulties and, and development, social emotional development. And then I was interested in understanding the, the impact of the weather environment on children's social emotional development directly, but also indirectly, hypothesizing that it would lead to poor maternal mental health based on the evidence that, that I had shown you. And maternal mental health is measured with the Kessler 6. So in MCS3, when the children were five, the main respondent was asked, have you, or has someone said something insulting to you because of your ethnicity? Has a shopkeeper or a salesperson treated you uh, disrespectfully because of your ethnicity or your race? How often have you been treated unfairly just because of your ethnicity and your race? So this is about the, the main respondent. Okay, I have to hurry up. And yeah, they, they were asked about the family and the neighborhood. And the outcome here is social emotional development at wave five. So this is five years later. So I'm interested to understand how, you know, the longitudinal association between developing in a racist environment and social emotional development. And I see both a direct effect of growing up in a racist environment on increased social emotional difficulties of children. So a direct effect, but also indirectly by leading to a worsening of maternal mental health. And there's no evidence that the neighborhood in itself or common racist attacks prevalent in the neighborhood are associated with children's social emotional development, but there's evidence that whether the mother or the main respondent or other family members have experienced racial discrimination is associated with increased difficulties of the child six, year late, six years later when the, ki the kids are 11. And this again underestimates the role of racism on mental health in the early life course because the measures are again limited. It only asks about the last 12 months. It asks about limited domains, but also it doesn't capture experiences that the child themselves have experienced, right? They are 11, they have gone through primary school. If they live in a, in a racist environment, chances are they have also experienced racism themselves, which will therefore detrimentally impact their social emotional development. Okay, I'm gonna go very quickly, but I want to talk about, you know, the neighborhood mechanisms, how racism leads to increase le deprivation levels at the neighborhood and how sometimes people conflate the negative associations between area level deprivation and health with, so the concentration of poverty in an area with the concentration of people in an area. And these have really very differing effects on health. So concentration of poverty is highly detrimental to health, but concentration of poverty, uh, sorry, of people, confers protective effects on the health of minoritized ethnic groups. 
So there's stark ethnic inequities in area level deprivation. 31% of Pakistani people live in the 10% most deprived neighborhoods in England and Wales compared to 10% of all people in England and Wales. And the, as I mentioned before, concentration of p poverty in an area, area level deprivation is highly detrimental to health. But when we adjust for the detrimental impact of area deprivation on health, we see that concentration of ethnic minority people in an area is actually protective of the health and mental health of ethnic minority people in a neighborhood. And this has been termed the ethnic density effect. And we have used many of the data sets available in the UK data service linked to census data to document this. We have conducted systematic reviews and my colleague Jay Munchi and I conducted a meta-analysis. These are some of, of the findings from that work which use data from the empiric study, which is a great study that I hadn't mentioned, but this figure here looks at the overall association between increased ethnic density, so increased proportions of ethnic minority groups in a neighborhood and a reduction or lower odds of reporting psychotic symptomatology using data from Empiric and the Fourth National Survey. And the ethnic density effect operates via multiple mechanisms, including stronger social support, stronger sense of community, enhanced social cohesion, reduced exposure to racial discrimination, and a buffering effect of the association between racial discrimination and health. And this graph shows data from the Fourth National Survey looking at the association between increased ethnic density and lower odds of reporting racial discrimination for own ethnic density and for overall ethnic minority density. This again shows data from the Fourth National Survey of Ethnic Minorities showing an association between increased ethnic density and lower odds of reporting psychotic symptomatology. And this graph, which is quite colorful, shows the buffering effect of ethnic density on health. So you can see here the relative probability of reporting psychotic symptomatology for minoritized ethnic groups who have experienced racial discrimination compared to ethnic minority people who have not experiencing re experienced racial discrimination at different levels of ethnic density. And in low levels of ethnic density, you can see that, as I showed before, people who have experienced racial discrimination have higher odds of poor mental health. But as ethnic density increases, this negative association reduces in strength except for Pakistani people, but we have only found this for the Fourth National Survey and only for psychotic symptomatology, so it may be something about the particular data or the measure, because we haven't seen this, this divergent trajectory elsewhere. Okay, so I want to close by showing you how we can use linked health survey data to census data to really disentangle the differing forces between structural forces driven by racism that have strong detrimental impact on health versus community forces, the concentration of people from minoritized ethnic groups, which show protective effects on health. And I'm interested in doing this because there's a consistent narrative in political and academic discourses that diversity is bad for health, but also for cohesion and for people getting on well together. And using data from the 2005 and 2007 citizenship survey linked to census data, we can really show how the different association between increased proportion of people, ethnic density, and increased proportion of poverty, area level deprivation, and how these really have very different relationships with outcomes. So in what this shows is the association between own ethnic density in purple and social cohesion. So as on, and this is unadjusted for area level deprivation and adjust for individual level factors. As own ethnic density increases, there's really no association with social cohesion. Yeah. But then in, level, in model two, in gray, we adjust for area level deprivation. And what you can see here is a strong association between increased area level deprivation and reduced social cohesion. So, Area level of prevention is not only detrimental for health, but for all other social outcomes that are strongly related to health. 
So really strong detrimental associations between area level deprivation and social cohesion. And then in the third model, in blue, you can see again the effect of ethnic density, but this time adjusting for area level deprivation. So when we take into account the detrimental association between area level deprivation and health and social outcomes, ethnic density is actually beneficial, has a positive association with increased social cohesion. And okay, I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> this is another example. Yeah. Do you want to just finish off the last yeah. slide? Yeah. The last slide, yeah. So health survey data, it is so important for us to be able to document the prevalence and the causes of inequities, but we have to advocate for the inclusion of minoritized groups in the data, and we have to think about what we ask of the participants and of the data. Yeah, that's good. Yay. Thank you, Maya. Did you want to show the last photographs? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank my colleagues, but importantly, I'd like to acknowledge James Nasro and Mike Stafford, who I met in this building and who have done a lot of this work with me and who are really amazing colleagues and, and lovely people.